Well, as you see, I choose a topic which is rather mainstream. That is to say, it's uh, maybe even a easy alibi kind of naming more intricate problems. The idea is don't do it and everything will work out fine. So sometimes uh, in recent months, even there is more like an attempt to uh, dispute the market, you know, to, to, to talk about the trivial things like who is entitled to uh, where the dreadlocks or some patterns of uh, Native American uh, culture. But of course, uh, the proper way to deal with it is uh, much more uh, complicated. It is uh, on different levels. We may go back and see uh, what kind of uh, very really remarkable achievements are made by cultural appropriation. I mean, from Picasso to Elvis Presley or something like that. But however, even in these mainstream formulations, it's obviously that the cultural appropriation is a, an a expression of an asymmetry of power. I mean, you, you have the power, you can take something, and even if you decide to give it back in a certain way, it's still you are the one who has the power. So maybe a right metaphor for this is, is the now very popular colorblind casting for all kinds of uh, productions. Because, you know, in color kind casting, it's always someone else who has the last word. You are the power who is choosing. Now, in some fields, uh, for instance, for art objects, uh, it seems to be uh, quite an easy thing to do. This. You just give the objects back. And uh, in the recent years, there is really, it's happening. That is, uh, stolen cultural objects are slowly, but still uh, obviously given back. Uh, well, concerning this kind of topic, I rather like the idea of uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya, who, uh, apropos the return of the Berlin bronze to Nigeria, suggested it would be a better idea to make a proper exchange, that is to send some Western art to Nigeria and keep some of the Benin bronzes. Uh, the whole uh, issue, I mean, it's not my field really, but the visual aspects of cultural appropriation are, for instance, very nicely examined in the uh, reader edited by Martin Jay and Sumati Ramaswamy about the so-called empires of vision. There is, uh, for instance, a wonderful story about color, a pigment called Indian yellow, uh, uh, very important for uh, Dutch uh, art in the 17th century. But then uh, sort of uh, in, in a really uh, deliberate campaign uh, proclaimed to be uh, unacceptable and the whole production suddenly collapsed. But still, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm going back to my power control appropriation uh, issue. But I'm trying to uh, somehow find the other side. That is, uh, what when uh, someone is taking or emulating or admiring forms uh, uh, develop somewhere else. It's, uh, well, if you go really back and uh, with the Goethe and uh, Marx Engels in the manifesto idea of word literature as one, one but unequal. So uh, in the Com communism manifesto, uh, there is a sort of prediction that the world literature, like everything else, will be uh, global. Uh, there is, of course, no mention of translation implies, I suppose it's really more about an unequal takeover. But nowadays we are much more sophisticated. We try to find out how exactly the cultural transfer works. That is, there are uh, very nice uh, uh, and very deep uh, uh, research done about the material materiality of communication or the ways to uh, compare different kinds of uh, the history of senses to uh, that is um, the sensual experience in the way uh, from Michel Serre or Jacques Ancier, 
So uh, it's uh, there is that we have now tools to see what is really transferred, who has the power, who has the wish, or, or is imposed upon that he, uh, not having any choice to participate in something globally happening. And of course, the plurality of castles was very, really in doubt, even uh, in times where it's only a question of rejection on denigrating. So, you know, even if you judge everything else to be barbarian, it's uh, first of all seen as something that is different. That is, uh, uh, but the less obvious is the hybridity and two sided borrowing going on all the time. That is the fact that culture is a product of an in between of a transmission on a transfer of a mediation. That is uh, the in the language uh, we now uh, don't use very often uh, the pro process of naturalizing of representing a historical and cultural process as natural, of course, and a result of ideological discourses. Uh, was always a major force in maintenance of hegemony. Um, as I've thought, there are now really uh, sophisticated ways of trying to assess what is really going on. I mean, uh, if using a very simple analogy, uh, we have some ideas about changes imposed by new techniques by trains, by uh, phones, by uh, the way uh, we now have a different experience of space and time, but we don't really know what happens in a kind of cultural transfer. I, in my paper, I use an example, uh, maybe too simple, maybe too uh, benign. Uh, we all know that at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, Vienna was a place of remarkable achievements in a number of fields, in art and architecture, in literature and philosophy, and of course, uh, psychoanalysis, we heard now of some complications happening in the transfer or transmission of these kind of ideas. Now, the, uh, something happened there. It's an event and something that uh, has probably a uh, genealogy, but it's not my theme here. Uh, what I wanted to concentrate on is uh, what happens when these uh, events, these achievements are translated into transferred. And there are uh, comparative studies done, for instance, for a recreation for Zagreb. That's of course not, a, not very far away, but it's still a connection between a place where it's happened and a provincial outlet of maybe the same type of, of cultures. And uh, obviously in both in Zagreb and other places in Central Europe, Europe uh, this kind of new artifacts, events, uh, performances introduced uh, new types of doing things. Well, uh, some of it is just the plain following of something seen as a successful mo uh, model, but uh, it mostly uh, depends on seeing it as a compulsory, as modern, as a progressive way. And that's, of course, uh, uh, very much of things happening in the transportation and transfer of cultural models is uh, a part of an understanding of history as something that has a obvious direction that is uh, going in a place. And then uh, if you don't want to become obsolete, you have to adapt to be part of it. Of course, there's always the possibility of rejecting this kind of values and going to for established values. But uh, seen generally, uh, technology and modernizations are part of all kinds of, we can even call them revolutions. That is, they are seen as something opposed to traditional and static societies. And uh, when it's connected to specific sites, you can even follow how exactly it works out. And uh, of course, the different 
types of uh, emerging modernisms are not only uh, not only connected, but still, we are, as I've told you already, as I was, that um, we are, to a certain extent, uh, able to uh, or trying to follow the impact of uh, a modernist work, a text, or a building, or a film, uh, to the introduction of phones and telegraphs and automobiles or all these kinds of uh, achievements as well. And, uh, and of course, uh, it's uh, if you go back to the Vienna of the Circle, it's uh, so we can be moved by the past, as is the title of a historical book. There is a regressive and there is a revolutionary mode that is uh, we try to either remain stuck in nostalgia and reenact the past, or uh, we try to severe the ties with the past to burn our bridges. And of course, there are some uh, rather newfangled theories of time and space that are stressing the impact of acceleration of. Uh, uh, Temporal structures that uh, 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 are connected with the way that now algorithms determine our actions. So that if we try to make an effort to control the economic forces, uh, we are attempted to speak out against these temporal structures of modernity and uh, take a stand against acceleration. So these kind of new space-time formations are part of the way we think that we have to accept what is an achievement, even if it is uh, outside of our ways of proceeding up to the point when uh, the impact is felt. Uh, well, I have here much too much of a text where uh, there are all kinds of uh, issues concerning the place where, where we are, where we're thinking, and uh, uh, how the ways uh, the emphasis of identity uh, are uh, a trap if it's essentialized. Uh, uh, so we uh, are defined, of course, contextually. And identity, if it's uh, presented as a collective right, a need of uh, recognition, is part of the basic gesture. We, of course, more or less all uh, accept that. Uh, what we do is uh, a constant effort to uh, out or to uh, uh, deconstruct particular interests that are masked as universal. But still, we live in a world of global exchange where the artifacts and the new ways of dealing with uh, all kinds of old genres is uh, claiming rights. That is, we, uh, we of course can say that the uh, translation, the issue, the big issue of this wonderful conference is at the same time something that is both boring and both fascinating. That is, uh, we all are somehow used to uh, work with different codes, the vernacular and the international. We do assume that we uh, have a fairly stable code of shared meaning, uh, but we know that um, we can't presuppose uh, uh, it was already a, a topic discussed here. What kind of monoculture is uh, defining us? Uh, they are, of course, always open and up incomplete and open to debate. But we still, of course, while we produce things, uh, assume uh, a certain freedom, a free con con consciousness, a uh, ability to oversee the totality of meaning. But um, of course, there are other ways, even pre-reflective or anti-predictive. I uh, try to introduce an uh, old book about interpretation of pragmatics. We used to be rather impressed by it. It's uh, the quotation from Jean-Jacques, the circle about Theories, moment of imposture of interventionist translation. Uh, that is a uh, translation seen as a part of the general problem of uh, interpretation. And really, the, the 
I'm not going to uh, either anticipate what's going to be discussed uh, later or has already been discussed, but it's kind of a problem for the, uh, I even have well, a sort of very private and uh, uh, very simple experience uh, with translations. Uh, I, for decades now, I'm for different reasons, I've done a lot of translations and the constant uh, fight I have with the uh, well, editors or people who have the power to publish something or not is uh, my uh, basic uh, understanding of translation as a uh, an effort to manifest in my own language the foreigners of the other. That is that I uh, don't want to uh, forget about the source of sensation by doing it. And it's very much opposed to the reigning uh, uh, way translation is supposed to be done in the language I'm uh, writing usually, that is that you have to somehow to obliterate the traces of what's happening. Uh, I tried and I have here a sort of uh, excourse on the last decades of, the, of Yugoslavia, uh, the way we were looking, we had the context and we were looking for answers from the others. The, the way uh, keeping up an intra-Yugoslav dialogue and looking constantly for alternatives and uh, the way uh, of a sort of more or less, but not very distant look uh, at Western achievements. So the, uh, it's, uh, it was, of course, uh, now uh, the obsession by national identity uh, tends to obliterate this kind of uh, dialogue situations we were, uh, I must really say, enjoying in the last decades of uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, okay, so it's more or less replaced by more uh, well, open or less open xenophobia and the change uh, of uh, habits. But okay not only to, uh, to stay with our Yugoslav experiences, I'm in speaking about uh, hybrid cultures and uh, uh, opposing hybridity to the uh, uh, emphasis on uh, essential identities. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to dwell on a point that I I think it's the most interesting in the world by Nestor Garcia Canclini. Uh, I'm now really uh, simplifying it, but as I read it, he, he claims that um, in this kind of impact, the modern and the high culture correspond to the hegemonic. Whereas, whereas, whereas traditional and popular culture correspond to the subaltern, that is, he uh, opposes spontaneous cultural appropriation, even if it's uh, the appropriate, uh, that is what is happening in, uh, in a field of, uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, like uh, you speak about uh, people who are spontaneously polyglot because they uh, are not uh, so bound to the one and only language that they just use the kind of uh, words that, uh, for things that they encounter the first time. So there is a sort of uh, spontaneous two-sided cultural appropriation in fields that don't have this elevated cultural capital of uh, high achievements. I don't really know, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing it as a topic of discussion. Is that uh, uh, a different kind of empowerment by this added hybridity uh, that is really uh, subverting both the impact of uh, imported, I say, summarily Western uh, artifacts and and uh, texts, and because they do they do disrupt national narratives. So uh, it seems to be that um, 
the way uh, or the, what we must uh, and do consider as an achievement is sometimes more hegemonic and uh, less uh, productive in developing uh, a different kind of creativity than the products of cultural industry. It seems a paradox and I really don't know if it works out or not, but uh, this kind of, uh, and the last topic I'm now trying to, uh, I'm going to jump some things uh, again, it's something that's been um, sometimes the, when it was first published, we uh, had a very uh, impassionate debates about some uh, ideas of uh, Todorov's conquest of America. You all know, you know, that uh, one of the reasons uh, of he claims uh, made uh, possible the very conquest of a small number of uh, uh, invaders and colonizers uh, is that they were able to use translation, not only in the sense that they have they had this uh, Malinche kind of collaborators, but because they were able to manipulate the, they knew about themselves, their identity and their language, and they were able to somehow uh, introduce or manipulate what they uh, were able to see about the other. That is, having this kind of dual, the possibility of translating made them, uh, there was an additional tool, of course, there were guns and, and horses and all kinds of other things, but still the, the, this is really the here uh, often uh, mentioned virus of translation. It gives you a tool because you have a, an additional way of, uh, introducing and uh, muddling and messing up with other people because you have uh, you can switch vocabularies uh, of course that is only a, a few uh, remarks on the relations between uh, different kinds of cultural uh, context the tensions the struggles for recognition and again i have here a lot of Quotation, which I'm not going to bore you with it, but that uh, the Can Bach you... claim, the, I'm going to finish. The Bach claimed that uh, only in the eyes of another culture, a culture reveals itself, and uh, the Rida, it's proper, what is proper to a culture is not to be identical with itself. But however, I think that uh, if we start with the, as, as, as I did, with a trivial point about who is uh, entitled to use uh, uh, products or, or ways of dealing or even fashion accessories from a different background and who uh, has a claim because what he does or she does is an achievement, uh, clear, like the Vienna example, there are things you don't have to be, uh, uh, the idea that psychoanalysis or Wittgenstein or whatever happened there, is still relevant to us and has to be an element of the global culture that does connect us, but does connect us in a, as I already said, an unequal way. Thank you.